I don't normally talk with the microphone, so I apologize if, you, if, if it's a little awkward. Um, give me one second here. How's everybody doing? Good. Good? Everybody have a good dinner? Good. So I am going to stand over here because that's really bright in my eyes and blocks the light there. Um, I tend to like to move around. So my name is William K. Um, welcome, and I hope you get some good information tonight. I, I am the owner of Aegis Pest Management. Um, we, I've been in the business for over 12 years. I have a degree from Northwestern University, and I've, all my advanced pest management training um, I got from the University of Florida and Purdue University. Is, can everybody hear okay? No. No? Okay. I'm, I realize i got to hold this a little closer. Um, over here we have Earl Hampton and Steve Key. Hi. They're both folks that are going to be working with you in the building. Earl's primarily here every week, so he's the guy you, you'll typically see. Um, we're going to have some time afterwards so you can answer kind of one-on-one -on -one question for a little bit. If anybody has any questions for things, I'm more than happy to answer some questions. But really, that's the, the goal of tonight is to get you to understand a little bit about what it is we do exactly and why we do what we do. So my goal really with when I give these presentations is to try to get you to see pest management and pests the way we see them. Because if you, if you understand what it is that we do and why we're doing it, you, have to, you tend to have a little bit more patience and you understand um, the nature of the problem and why maybe, because sometimes there's problems that just, they don't go away like that and we gotta work the problem. And sometimes knowing a little bit more allows you to give us information that's a little bit more helpful as we work through processes, okay? Um, we, I, just to give a, a little bit of background my experience, I used to live over at Park Tower. Um, we, I got into the business because I got a bed bug dog and we started doing inspections there. And I got really frustrated with the pest control companies who did the treatment. So I went and got my pest control license and I started working problems with, with primarily bed bugs. And then other buildings got to know me and they started asking me to do, do work in that building. And so we, we've grown the business over the last 10 years, primarily exclusively, not, not entirely, but mostly working mul large multi-residential buildings, which as you'll see as I talk, they present a unique problem. So if you come from a single family home and you're like, well, we had ants and they got rid of it. When you have pest problems in a larger building, you have to, come, you have to take into consideration all the surrounding apartments and, all the, and, the, and the structure and how electrical lines are run and pipes run and those types of things in order to be effective in the job. Okay, so that's our experience is almost exclusively working difficult pest control problems in large buildings. We usually don't get called in until several other people have failed. Okay, so and, and the one thing about that, it tends to mean that the problems that we're inheriting are difficult and they take time to resolve. So, um, so tonight's agenda, we're gonna talk, I'm just gonna kind of cover some of the common pests that we see when we're working the buildings that we work in, particularly in Chicago. It's not all of them, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's kind of like the, 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 the biggest ones that, that, that we see 90% of the time, maybe more than that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our approach and how we, we handle pest control, how we approach problems, how we resolve problems, and then give you an opportunity to ask us some questions. Every, sound good to everybody? Yeah. Okay. I want to ask, wait till afterwards, but I'll, I'll allow you, what's up? I just would like to know, are you new in this building? Yes. Thank you. We've been about a little over a month now, I think. Okay, thank Two you. months. Two months. But we, yeah. That's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing to consider when you're talking about pests, whether it's cockroaches or ants or mice, is every living creature essentially needs the same things. They need food, they need water, and they need shelter. When you look at pest control from that standpoint of like, how, what do these things need and how are they getting it? We have a, we have a way of approaching it so that we can see what they're doing and how they're doing it and that 
can affect what we do, okay? So first of all, we're just gonna kinda go into some quick, some of the, the, the things that we typically see that are more nuisance pests. Um, these are gnats, types of gnats that we typically see. Fungus gnats, fungus gnats typically if you have house plants and you're overwatering them and you have fungus in your soil, you'll get fungus gnats. And sometimes people misconstrue those with drain flies or fruit flies. But if, let's say if you have a plant and you're seeing flies around it, probably a fungus gnat, okay? We need to see these things in order to identify it, but fungus gnats can be tricky for us sometimes because we don't always see them. You might see them after you water your plants and then never again, but that's what we, we those are those are something that we don't see them very often when we see them. You'd usually typically see them around plants. Um, drain flies, drain flies live in your drains. They usually live off of um, fungus and mold and things that are living in your drains. So one of the things when you're dealing with drain flies, if you want to prevent them, keep your drains cleaned. Don't just use bleach, use some type of uh, cleaner that has enzymes that eats away at the at the uh, the mold that, and so forth that's in there. Again, if you take away their food, you take away their ability to thrive. If we can take away one of those three things, we have you can you can deal with pest control issues sometimes without spraying any pesticides. And that's our the ultimate goal is to try to help you live without those types of things in your home. Okay, and then the, one of the other most common things that we see is fruit flies. You get these, you pick up a banana or an orange from the grocery store, you bring it home, you got your fruit sitting in a bowl on the counter, and you start seeing flies. They can migrate to your garbage, they can migrate to dirty dishes. So when it comes to fruit flies, the best thing that you can do before anything we even get involved is clean everything. Clean your sink, clean your garbage can, make sure you don't have any dirty dishes out, make sure you don't have any fruit or vegetables out, any organic material that's aging or decaying, fruit flies live on it. And if we come in and you got fruit flies, the first thing we're gonna tell you to do is clean out your garbage can, get rid of the fruit, get rid of the dirty dishes, okay? Another one that we typically see are uh, clothes moths. Um, there's other types of moths, but these are the what we see. These are the things that will destroy your blankets and your clothes and your clothing. And they, they multiply because they, they mate, they lay their eggs in your clothing, in your blankets, in, the, in your natural fibers. It doesn't just have to be wool. Any natural fiber a clothes moth can live on and thrive. They lay their eggs, the larvae hatches, the larvae feeds on your, the fibers, then they multiply again, and so on and so forth. And that's, at a certain point, they get out of control and it, we have to take some, some other kinds of measures other than just using the pheromone traps that we typically use. Nine times out of 10, we can resolve a problem with a pheromone trap if we get in there ahead of time. If, you get, if they let it get too bad, it'll start affecting your neighbors and it'll be much more difficult to remediate. Um, common house ants, little black, tiny little black ants. Um, again, the, when you were talking about ants, there may be about a 16th to an eighth of an inch. Everybody has seen these ants. If you live in the Midwest, you've seen the little black ants. They're house ants. They live on any food material that you have in the house. Sugar, oils, anything. Even the little bit of residue on your countertops and your floors is enough to feed hundreds of ants. Pharaoh ants are even smaller. Very, very small. Golden brown in color. Almost translucent. I can't see them unless I've got a flashlight on them when they're moving. So they're very difficult to identify. But you'll see them when they, they swarm. But the pharaoh ants are very, very small, golden brown in color. Carpenter ants, much larger. Not likely to see them here. This is a, a, a concrete structure. Carpenter ants live and thrive in decaying wood. So unless you have something wooden in your apartment that's, that's been, has some water damage to it, you're probably not likely to see carpenter ants. The biggest thing that we, the, the, one of the biggest pests that we see that's the biggest problem in multi-residential buildings is cockroaches. Now, a lot of people want to just say cockroaches are cro cro cockroaches. They'll call one type of cockroach. How many people say they've seen a water bug? You know water bugs? A water bug is just a cockroach. Water bugs, typically, these are the bugs that people usually consider water bugs. American cockroach, oriental, uh, smoky brown cockroach, and a brown banded cockroach. 
We don't see them that much in buildings like this, particularly buildings that have been built, I would say, in the 70s or later. Um, these cockroaches primarily live and thrive in a sewage situation. They live on decaying material, living in sewers and so forth. You're looking, do we have, do we have am I missing something? Oh, no, you did. Okay, you gave me a look like, he's not telling no, no. that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you see these, typically what has happened is they've come up through the drain system and into your apartment. They do not, they're not gonna thrive in your apartment. They're not gonna live very long outside of your, your drain pipes or in the sewers. Usually within 48 to 72 hours, they're gonna dehydrate and die. They're just, they want a, a warm, damp environment. They thrive on decaying material. You don't really have a lot of that in any apartment. The one that we're most concerned about is the German cockroach. This is the common cockroach that people, when they say, I've got cockroaches, this is the problem. They, they breed quickly, they move to other units quickly, and they, they're, they, there can be issues with them in terms of um, sanitation. So when it comes to cockroaches, again, we, we go back to the fruit flies. One of the first things that we're going to tell you if we walk into an apartment and there's a problem, no dirty dishes in the sink, no food left out on the counters, no crumbs, no food residue, no oils, no sugars. A tiny little crumb will feed dozens, dozens of cockroaches. So sanitation is, is one of the, the most important things when it comes to cockroaches. Um, where do they hide typically? So they can, they're tricky. Where they where you see them in, in big buildings like this is they make their way, they're moving along the pipes, the drain pipes, the water pipes. That's why you typically see them in kitchens a lot of times. They, they make their way in and they, they harborage a lot in wall voids behind the walls so like if your your drain pipe goes in the wall they might be behind there they there's always 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 a gap between the back of your cabinet and the wall we can't get to that spot it's very difficult to get to that's why they love it they can get in and out without being seen and that they're usually active at night um, they also like if you have any little cracks and crevices the hinges on your doors the outlets and above the countertops these are things that that if you're having a problem that we need to treat, okay? Um, there's three ways to help prevent, minimize risk of a cockroach infestation. Clean, clean, and clean. <laughs> the cleaner you are, the less food that they have available to them. Again, we're going back to those three things that, that every pest needs. Food, water, and shelter. Shelter, there's nothing we can do about it. Pests find ways to shelter in your home. That's what they're really good at, and that's why they're a problem. That's why we have a job. But we can control their access to water. You can control their access to water. You can control their access to food by making sure that your kitchens and your bathrooms don't have things that they can feed on. That means clean counters, no dirty dishes in the sink. Make sure the sink is dry at the end of the night and you put a cap on it. They can't get, to, like a lot of people think, oh, they're coming out of the drains, they're living in the drains. No, they're going in the drains to drink water. So if you cap that drain, you eliminate their access to water. If you clean your countertops and put away all your, your dirty dishes, you eliminate their access to food. So that when we come in and do our job, it's the, our ability to, to remediate the problem quickly is a lot, the chances of that happening are a lot better, okay? Do not self-treat your apartment. I've been in a number of units and I see cans of Raid everywhere. This is a huge problem in multi-residential buildings. A huge problem. When I was at the University of Florida, we did tests on products that killed cockroaches. We put different products in different Tupperware containers and we dumped dozens of cockroaches in each container. And we watched over a one week period how long it took for the cockroaches to die. The baits that we used, all the cockroaches dead in under an hour. All the sprays that we used, dead in half a day. All the ones with over the counter products, none of those cockroaches ever died. They sat in those containers all week long. You know what, that when you spray Raid, what it does do? It 
it's repellent in nature. So if you spray it here, all those cockroaches are there, guess where they're going? To your neighbor. <laughs> Do not self-treat pest problems. Contact the office, let them know you think you have a problem, we'll get you on the schedule, and we'll get you taken care of, okay? Don't spray anything. If you have raid in your home now, throw it out. It's, it's worse than useless. It's actually more, it, more of a problem than, you, than it's actually solving. Okay, the other, now this can be a touchy subject because bed bugs, people have a perception of bed bugs is like, I, oh, I'm clean, I shouldn't have bed bugs. I don't, it's, 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 there's a stigma to it. There's three things that draw a bed bug to you, and there's three things that draw a mosquito to you. It's the same things your body heat, your pheromones, and you, the CO2 that you give off. Nobody goes into a backyard and says, oh, I've got mosquitoes, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Bed bugs are the, it's the same mechanism that draws them to you as the mosquitoes. These things have been around now in buildings like this, not just this building. I can take you up and down Sheridan Road, there's not one building that hasn't had at least some problem with, with bed bugs. And I can guarantee you, I bet my life savings that almost all of them have had a major issue at some point and had a difficulty resolving it. These, in my experience, these things come and go, they surge. There's, I can, I can talk for two hours on the why and where bed bugs and why you get bed bugs. I'm telling you, I've seen them everywhere. I've been in single room occupancy hotels on the west side of Chicago, not a single bed bug. I have been in $10 million penthouse condominiums and they've got bed bugs. They do not care how clean, how wealthy you are, how big your apartment is. They don't care. They need one thing. They need to, just like a mosquito, they need to feed on your blood. They need a blood meal to survive. They need food, water, and harborage. They get their food and water from your blood and they live in the tiniest things in your apartment. They don't just live on beds, they, live, they can live on anything. So when you go back to your apartment tonight, stand in your living room, look at everything that you have out. A clock radio, a bookcase, a chair, a picture frame. I can give you a list of hundreds of items long of where we found bed bugs. Okay? That they, they're, they're a problem because they're engineered to live symbiotically with human beings. There's nothing you've done wrong because you have bed bugs. Now, if you know you have bed bugs and you try to self-treat, that's maybe then you've done something wrong. If you know you have bed bugs and you've not reported it in a timely manner, then you've done something wrong. You need to be proactive about identifying it and letting us know. We will, I've had a couple questions. We will be starting our canines coming through and sweeping through the building quarterly. We're gonna be doing a little bit differently. Where you had them here for one week, they come in for one week and then they're gone for two months. We're gonna be here every week. So if something pops up in an area where we're not scheduled to inspect, we can check it. So if you have it, if you think you might have bed bugs, let the office know and we'll get a dog there quickly. And the goal is to get this to keep them from moving from unit to unit. Okay? What's that? Could you explain a little bit about the dog? Yeah. So the dogs, you guys have had dog you've had the canine. So does everybody understand what the dog's job is? <laughs> Sniff it Sniff it. But how many bugs do you think we train the dogs to smell? Bed bugs. A thousand? You don't need a dog to find a thousand, you'll see it yourself. When we train our dogs, we train them to find, we have little vials. And inside those vials, there's like the cap's got a hole in it and we put a little mesh top on there so they can't get out. And then we'll do, th like if we're working in this room, if we're training in this room, we'll tape some of those vials like underneath the chairs or on the wall or behind a picture frame. We'll let them sit there for anywhere from like 20 minutes to 24 hours. The job's dog is to find those three bugs, one to three bugs. That's it. Sometimes if there's a big infestation, sometimes those dogs will miss it because 
It's like going into a bakery and saying, go find the bread by the smell. It's everywhere. So don't panic if a dog alerts and you don't see bugs. Their job is to find them before you can see them. That's what their job is. Okay? We're going to be doing it weekly. We're going to be able to respond. The hope is that we're going to be able to respond to problems more quickly. Okay? Uh, just a quick thing. One of the reasons why they're, they're our problem is that 30% of the population genetically predisposed not to react to bed bug bites. So for every 100 people in the building, 30 of them statistically won't react to bed bug bites. And that sometimes is some of the worst infestations because they don't see them, because they're really good at hiding until it's too late. And now, a lot of times what happens is a neighbor reports them because they've spread, and then we find them in the neighboring unit because the person doesn't know. It's not their fault. They're genetically predisposed to do that. But I can tell you we're really good at, 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 at treating them. Really good at treating. Um, don't, again, don't try to self-treat bed bugs. You will make the problem far worse for yourself and for your neighbors. I just want to give a quick thing about bed bug life, life cycles because when it comes to identifying bed bugs, a bed bug, a baby bed bug is tiny. It could be, it's maybe a quarter the size of a sesame seed. And if it hasn't fed yet, they're, they're translucent, they're incredibly hard to see. Um, the eggs, forget about trying to find the eggs. Unless, you, unless you're doing my job, unless it's super obvious, you're not going to see the bed bugs. I mean, you're not going to see the bed bug eggs. This picture gives you an idea of what happens. So you can see like when a, when a bed bug feeds, it can look almost like a co totally different bug. So when you see pictures on the internet of a bed bug and then you see a bug and say, oh, that's not a bed bug. If you squish a bug and it's got blood coming out of it, it's a bed bug, whether it looks like a bed bug or not to you, okay? Bed bugs can lay up to four to five eggs. Once they're inseminated, they lay up to four to five eggs a day until they lay 40 eggs. Within a two-week period, I believe it is, they're ready to reproduce again. It takes about four to five weeks for a baby bed bug to mature to adulthood to be able to, to reproduce. So they, the, the stat that I, that I learned when I first got into doing bed bug work was in six months, you can go from one bed bug to 31,000. Again, it, it's just to emphasize to be on it and let them know, let, let the management know as soon as you think you might have a problem. And then the last thing I'll leave you with it is don't panic about it. A lot of people panic and stress. Oddly enough, I can tell you from experience, bed bugs, generally speaking, are easier to remediate than cockroaches. And there's, there's for one reason. They only eat one thing. So we know where they need to be. A cockroach can feed on a thousand different things. And they can be in a thousand different places. But if you... If you're sitting on a chair, you're sleeping on a bed, or you're laying down on a sofa, nine times out of ten, that's where the bed bugs are going to have to be. And we use products that use their behavior against themselves. I can again, I can go into like an hour long just on which products we use and how we use them. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that. But bed bug problems can be difficult for a number of reasons. The most difficult thing that that we the biggest challenge that we have is clutter. Again, go back to your apartment, look at all the things that are out there. The more stuff that you have out, the more places that they can hide. I, I have seen them, I just, we just worked in a, an apartment building out in Villa Park um, last week. We found them in, it was a woman's apartment, it was super, super cluttered. She had a crumpled uh, tissue behind the door. The bed bugs were living on that behind the door. They can live in bottle caps underneath the bed. Things underneath your bed are problematic. So the best thing you can do, again, is declutter. Declutter, declutter. It's the best thing you can do in terms of if, if we end up with a bed bug problem. We can still deal with it. It just may take longer for us to deal with it. Understand that. But we're really, really good at it. We started off in this business 
just focusing on bed bugs. Um, we know it really, really well. We understand their bio biology and behavior, and we've crafted our, our protocols around that. And then the best part about that is almost all the products we use are either very, very low toxicity or non-toxic completely. And they last a long time, which is also important. Um, so just to, that kind of goes into our, the way we approach pest control. Um, we practice what's referred to as integrated pest management. How many people's perception of a, of a pest control technician is a guy with a spray can? Right? We, we have them, right? So the perception is, I've got bugs, they're going to come in and they're going to spray, and my problem's going to go away. Right? First of all, it doesn't always work. Um, second of all, the products that we, that we use now are so much more targeted to specific bugs that their toxicity to humans are much, much lower but they have to be much more used much more targeted as well. So our goal is this, what I'm doing tonight is part of integrated pest management. It's educating you so that you can take action on yourself, that you can modify the environment some so that it's less hospitable to these bugs, to these pests. If you do that, maybe we don't have to spray anything. Maybe sometimes it's just fruit flies clean up the garbage, get rid of the old fruit, and guess what, the problem goes away. You didn't have to spray a thing. You didn't have to be exposed to anything. That's what integrated pest management is. And that's, we practice that. One of, our, one of the key components of that for us is to really understand what's going on in an environment, to look at what's going on. So that gets me to the three L's of pest control. This is something that I've come up with. It's, we, we look, we listen and we learn. We're gonna inspect your apartment in detail to find, if, if you're reporting a problem, to figure out where these things are harboring. Listen to you, so because sometimes just you telling us information, something, you, even if it's innocuous, it may be like, ah, that makes sense. I've had these moments where people have told me information that they thought it was just this throwaway bit of information, and it's like, oh, we're not dealing with bed bugs, we're dealing with, um, Baby cockroaches. You know, it's it's interesting thing. Well, I see them in the kitchen. They're bed bugs. No, they're not bed bugs. They're baby cockroaches. So we have to we look at what your environment is. We listen to what you have to say. And most importantly, we need to learn the environment. And in a multi-residential building, that's a process. That takes time. We have to learn how things tend to move from unit to unit. You know, moving from an A unit to a B unit. A pest using from moving from an A unit to B unit may be different from a G to a K unit, you know. So it, it because of the structure and how those units are connect interconnected, all they're all interconnected. It's a matter of learning how this building works and wh what problems we typically have. That's our job. The other thing is our job is to to inform you what you can do to help the process be more effective. Okay. Oh, I think, oops, I went all the way past my last slide. Um, sorry about that. I hit the end button and said, okay. Um, if you see a cockroach again, report it immediately. Prepare for your treatment. Earl can tell you, we go in to treat, I've got cockroaches. Nobody's emptied anything underneath the countertops. If they give you notice that we're coming, empty everything out from underneath the, the kitchen sink and the bathroom sink. This allows us to get product behind the wall. Remember I said they can be behind the wall? This allows us to get product inside the wall voids. It's really important. It also lets us see what's going on up underneath your sink where there's food and water. Clear your countertops off because if we need to treat crevices and cracks and crevices up on your upper cabinets, we don't want anything on your cabinet, your on your your countertops. We need to be clear so we can see what's going on. We can see fecal stains. We can see activity that you may not see if there's a toaster there. Okay, so clear everything off if you can. I know housekeeping helps with this. We've had a couple issues, but at the very least, try to get the the, the items from underneath your sinks cleared out. 
and then keep these areas clutter free try not to leave your dirty dishes out try not to leave anything on the counter okay that's really important when it comes to cockroaches if you see a bed bug report it immediately you're going to get some really basic prep instructions i know housekeeping also helps with that but follow it to a t and then be patient and allow us to work the process our job is to communicate what we see and why if it's a problem is persisting to give you an explanation as to why sometimes even though we have protocols sometimes we have to vary from those protocols for a specific reason that's for us to identify but the other thing is to communicate to you why it may not be working out as quickly as we'd like so just we just ask for you to have some patience on that and again going back to bed bugs clutter is the enemy try to declutter as best you can sanitation and decluttering we can eliminate a lot of problems or minimize a lot of problems just with that alone all right i i think i've talked enough let's see yeah pretty good on timing um and so now we, we can take some questions from anybody does anybody have any questions you had your back there you had your your, your hand up first i have been told that roaches love coffee uh, cockroaches love anything that will give them food or water um, and coffee pots especially coffee pots with coffee grounds in them you know I go into an apartment and I can smell the coffee that's been there for a couple hours right so imagine it you have to think about these these creatures they have to find food via scent you know the antennae is what they're using to, uh, to detect these things if you had to, if the only way you can find food is by scent, your scent would be really good. So if you, as a human being, can smell something that attracts a cockroach, sure enough, they can. And so coffee is very pungent. Coffee makers also provide a harborage. If you have a severe infestation, I've seen them hiding up inside of those things. But any food, any kind of product like that is a problem not just coffee exclusively could you repeat back the questions oh the question is that was not, that, not this one to say but oh yeah come on yeah uh in the purple shirt yeah oh uh, yeah <laughs> um one of the earlier things you showed were these tiny little ants yes which i think is what i have some uh, problems with um i keep things fairly sanitary when i have a cat mm-hmm Yeah. Um, they're very tiny. Um, um, the only other time I had them is when I had guests over and we had pizza and we just put them in the sink and we're doing other stuff and came back. <laughs> where they come from. I'm not sure where they're coming from. Yeah. I managed to keep them down. Um, I used scotch tape and got them off. Yeah, don't spray. No, I didn't because, spray. I used scotch yeah. tape. Ants, so the ants that I showed are only like three of the most common ones. There's hundreds of ants. Well, these are really yeah. Tiny. I wasn't sure what they were. We need to take a look at them. Work, like sometimes we got to take them back from a for, well, in a I, magnifying I've glass. Them, but what I've done um, is I have a large um, kind of a, a bowl filled with water, and I have the cat dish in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. that. Okay. Let the cat eat, but not have to. That's a smart. So do, that's smart. Yeah, but, but he's also it. saying don't don't treat yourself. If you're finding something in your well, apartment, we the number talking, one thing. We were trying to talk about this, but there was no uh, proof about these kind of points. Uh, at least I if you so if you can catch them with a piece of tape, save them so then we can identify. Yeah. A yeah. note about yeah. ants. So yeah, don't try to self treat. Or don't try to self remediate. Go ahead, well, Earl. Ghost ants. Ghost ants? Earl believes those are ghosts. Here, there's one of these here. Are these the ghosts? So, let me let me explain something about ants. There's only one way to kill ants, and that's to kill the queens. So, if you have a colony of ants, the the ants that are producing more ants are not walking around on your counter. They're they're hidden somewhere. Let me let me finish. So, the only way to kill queens is to get poison to them. That's why we use baits. If you spray a surface with Raid, they won't eat bait from that surface, and you've taken that tool out of our, our, our toolbox. 
they're, they're frustrating because you have to get bait into the, the work grants. They have to bring it up the food chain to the queen. That's how you, get, that's how you affect the economy. Yep. So oddly, we're yeah, I think we're seeing uh, yeah. a lot of ant activity throughout the building. Um, as I explained to a what what unit number are you? Twenty one K. Twenty one. Have I have we met? I don't think so. Okay, so there are there are several several units in the building that are having issues with ants, and um, there are several units in the building that are having issues with ants, um, and it's just going to take us to get into those units. So, and the reason why I ask because I've met have I met you yet? There are several units we just have not gotten into yet. Um, there are a few units that I've treated two three times in a three week period, in a two or three week period, and they are seeing a decline in their ant activity. So 21K, we'll put you on the list and I'll see you Friday. Okay, but the thing is, if, if I'm, not, I'm trying to not have any food out, so right. it's very seldom that I'll see one. And when I do, I tell it right away. So we have a, you know I mean? so, so we have a, we have a trick that we use when, we, when there's a persistent problem here. And but it's, it's, it's counterintuitive. So we need to see activity in order to diagnose a problem. Right. If you tell me I see ants and I go there and I see no ants, we're not going to be able to do much. Right. Right. So one of the things we do, that honey is very pungent. If you put even just like a little dollop of honey on the table, you can smell it, right? As soon as you open up the honey. You, so the ants love honey. So if you say, I'm seeing ants on the counter or on the floor, in the kitchen or in the bathroom, when you know we're coming in that day, not a lot, like some people, oh, they, they put like a whole bottle down. No, you, I'm talking a, a, a drop like the size of a dime in the, a couple of these in the spots where you see activity. What this does for us is it draws them out. It allows us to see, not all the time, it allows us to see the pathway of where they're coming from and going to. Ants follow trails. They follow pheromone trails. So if one ant travels from point A to point B, the next ant can smell that trail. And if there's food there, they're going to keep going back and forth and back and forth. But they're not always there. So if you put honey down in a spot, now we might go in there and see hundreds or even thousands of ants. Not great in that moment, but it's great for us. Because what that allows us to do, it allows us to get bait into hundreds or thousands of ants' bellies, which means they can get to more and more queens in the in the colony. If we can get bait to the queens, we can have a much greater effect on the ant population. Because if you can kill the queens, you kill their ability to reproduce. Okay? And I'm sorry, that was the point that I was trying to make, that if we can get to the queen, we can kill the colony. And the more units that we're getting into, the higher likelihood yeah. we're able to get to the queen. And if it's building wide, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. It's going to be a problem. And all I have to do is deliberately hard the bank. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when we're done, we, you know, we clean it up. We clean it up. I, 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 we've used this method a lot, and it, it's, it's not always, it, it's effective to some degrees, but it's, it's almost always has some effect. Sometimes it's, it's really good at eliminating. May I clarify one thing? Sure. So you're saying you want to track them. It's only at the time just before you come. Correct. Not not, 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 in, perp not in perpetuity. <laughs> just before the... You better come. Yeah. yeah. So make sure you know you're on the list for that day. Okay. Okay? Don't just put it... You can call down and say, am I on the list? Yes. And timing is a good thing because if they know about it and you put it out, you know, you may put it out and by the time we get there. So we want to make sure you're... Well, you may get... We may get there and we don't get there in time and they've already fed all the honey and they've gone back. So we want to make sure we get there, not right away, but so, like within an hour or two before, after you put it down. Okay. So it'll be a coordination. Yeah, if you, if you put it down and you see tons of it right away and you know that, you know, Earl gets here sometime around 10 
a.m. on Friday. So I wouldn't put it down until 10 a.m. If you put it down and you see activity right away, I would call them and they'll they'll get a hold of him and he'll get there right away. Okay? I, I have confidence that you would get there right away if yeah. I called Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. No, no. Repeat the question, please. The, the, the question is if they have pets, and would the, would, the, would the bed bugs be on your pets? So there is a guy, uh, an entomologist out of the University of Florida named Phil Kohler. Phil early on did a ton of research on bed bug behavior and activity, and one of the things they, they did is they brought in all these trailers and they set up these trailers like apartments and they infested them in different ways with bed bugs. They made graduate students sleep in them so they could see what would happen. So they, but one of the things they did is they, they put, they set up a trailer filled with bed bugs, it looked like a little one room apartment, and then they introduced pets, dogs, cats, mice, things like that. And then they pulled them out and they looked for bed bugs on them. What they found is unless they're absolutely deal. They won't go to your pets. Bed bugs. They're looking for human pheromone. They're looking for human CO2. They're looking for human body heat. It's their another experiment that they did is they looked at um, what attracts bed bugs besides like the CO2 and your body heat. And the reason they find out about pheromones is they they took they made the graduate students wear like jeans and then they took they wore them for like two days and then they took the jeans off they cut like two inch discs out of the jeans and they placed them in these giant petri dishes with like i don't know like 12 other discs from other jeans that weren't worn by anybody so they had one one piece of cloth that was from clothing that was worn and then about 11 or 12 other pieces of cloth that nobody wore and then they dropped about two dozen bed bugs into that petri dish. All those bugs went to that disc from the clothing that was worn. They are attracted to human beings. There's no, there's nothing about a, a, a pheromones that your cat gives off or your dog gives off that's going to attract them. So what, what if you put some kind of spray on your body? Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do what? There's nothing you can do to mask yourself from a bed bug. Spray your body. Yes. Do not do that. Do not. Don't spray anything anywhere when it comes to bed bugs. So what, what, do you have to leave your apartment if you have bed bugs? The, well, yeah, during treatment, yes. During treatment, yes, you have to leave. For a couple of hours. For, for a few hours. Yes. Hold on. The lady in the back row. Yes. Do you move out of your apartment? That's a policy decision here in the building. And a lot of that has to do with the severity of the infestation. Though the question was, how long do you have to isolate in your apartment if you have bed bugs? I can't answer that question. Um, because, well, that, again, that's not up to me. That's, that's a decision that has to be made between yourself and the building. Yes. It, yeah, then we, we give them information and we advise them on that, but I, uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you come in and you find one bed, let, let's say we inspect your apartment with the dog and the dog alerts and I find two bed bugs on your bed and nothing else and we go in and treat, you know, what that isolation period need to be? Doesn't, I don't think it needs to be very long. But it's, again, it's the, one of the, the, the I, from what I understand, that policy has to do with protecting the building as a whole. It's not a bad policy. I have some strong opinions about what, how the treatment procedures were prior to us arriving um, that I can't really share with you. But my goal here is to minimize, our goal is to minimize the impact of any pest and to minimize our disruptiveness when we come in and treat. Okay, I can't say for you it's going to be X Y. You know, it's going to be X amount of days. I can't say because for me, I always look at it. How would I feel if it was my home? 
So if it's my home, my my advice to them is going to be something, but they have other considerations to take in, to consider, and I have nothing to do with that. That's a, a policy decision, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad one, but we do have to be we do have to try to moderate that. And I can promise you that we our goal is to eliminate these things as quickly as we can, and to make it so that you don't have to be isolated for very long. Okay. Yeah. I have some decorator pillows made of antique textiles mm -hmm. and have some clothing that's delicate. Uh, I'm concerned that if I ha ever have bed bugs, that they would send these things to a hot trailer and they will be ruined. Um. But well, we don't really use heat to treat anymore. I mean, it's possible. We have options for that. But um, here's the thing when it comes to heat. At 122 degrees, a bed bug dies in under a minute. It doesn't have to get super hot to kill them. You know, we're not putting it in there at 300 degrees. It'll burn. Um, it's not, it's not so typically a heat treatment, especially like a localized heat treatment, like a small heat tent, is not very hot at all. Not hot enough. I mean, you could you can stand in there. If if, if a human being can stand in that room and still live, then um, I, I'm sure your pillows would be fine. Okay. Yeah. Commonly, commonly, um, dryers are used to 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 kill uh, bed bugs or bed bug eggs that are on on bedding or. Uh, pillows when it is appropriate for that specific textile and that specific pillow um, but as William was saying the temperature that's required to kill a bed bug is lower than the temperature of a dryer um, they get they get beyond 120 degrees commonly. so we'll take into account if you have specific things you just make sure you communicate that oh, yes. and, and we'll take into account and hopefully that won't be a problem. Hopefully that'll never be an issue. But no, I had but, a scare a year ago. Oh, you did. Yeah. 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 Of course. We, but I mean, communicate very, with us. Yeah. We're, we're those types of things. We're going to be aware. If you let us know, we'll take them into consideration. Like I said, I could I could talk for. I can give you a dissertation on the products we use and how they actually affect the bugs and things like that. Um, but. Generally speaking, there, our goal with a lot of the products that we choose, because we work mostly in multi-residential buildings, is one, that it's not repellent, meaning it's not going to cause pests to move and disperse. Right? That's, that's goal number one. Let's try to keep it localized. Goal number two is to, is to keep your exposure to any kind of uh, products to a minimum. That's why we use very, very, very small amounts, and we're still very successful with it. Okay, so a lot of times when you're talking about those types of things, you know, we, we, we may have to be a little bit more creative, but we, we've been doing it for almost 12 years now, 10, 12 years. So it's, we, we understand the problem pretty well. Okay, I think maybe one more question and then we're going to let them yeah. wrap up for the night. The, right there. Can, uh, can a bed bug uh, be on a person's clothing? Uh, and and then can it if they're if it's on their clothing can that person transmit it to other places? Yes. Repeat the question. Can can a bed bug be on a on another per, on a person on their clothing or in their hair or on their shoes? Yes. Can is that how they get transferred? Frequently, yes. Frequently, yes. Um, in my experience, like I've been in some horrible situations as far as bed bugs are concerned. And I take measures to make sure I don't bring them home. And so far, 12 years, I've never brought any home. Um, the, I can tell you that the severity of the infestation dictates your likelihood of, of picking up a bed bug. If you have a really, really bad bed bug infestation and there's lots of them on your sofa and lots of them on your bed and you're sitting in there and then you, you're gonna go over to a friend's house, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a chance, there's a better chance that you're going to bring a bed, you know, a little traveler with you. Um, if there's only two, probably not going to be a big a problem. So the the sooner we can identify it, the sooner we can address it, it's better for everyone, not just for yourself. Okay. All right. I 
thank you for your patience. I hope this was, was informative to you. I know it's a little creepy. <laughs> but um, our goal again is to, I, my saying with pest control is a very simple thing, is how many people think my job is to kill bugs? Kill bugs. How many think my job is to kill bugs? Our job, our job, in essence, is to make you feel more safe and comfortable in your home. That's what our job is. What we do to do that is we happen to be killing a lot of bugs. But that's our job is to make you feel comfortable. So sometimes that means we got to talk to you. Sometimes we got to explain things to you. But that's our job. Okay. We're going to strive to do that. We appreciate your time this evening, and thank you for coming. Thank you.